people should be well caffeinated. Um, I am Bridget Trogdon. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Services here at AU as of three months ago. Um, and this, this invitation has been in the works for a while. We're happy to be able to welcome Kate Denial here with us. And so welcome to those of you who are here and those of you who are Zooming. Um, and the meeting is being recorded. Yes, it is. Okay, got it. Um, literally got it. Okay, so you know we want to make sure that we send some shout outs to those who are co-sponsors. So this is part of the AU Core. So the AU Core curriculum, our common curriculum for all of our undergraduate students, regardless of major, um, and CTRL. So thank you to everybody who's helped put this on. Um, we want to do extra shout outs. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing names. Been here three months. I will figure it out in the future. So let me know. Um, but a lot of people from AU Core and from CTRL who've done a lot of work for this. Um, so Sarah Frugian from AU Core, Diamond Brown, Lindsay Studer, Anna Olson from CTRL, and everybody who's really made this possible. So it's a, a great time to be able to come together and talk about our teaching and learning. So Kate Denial is here, very excited. She is the Bright Distinguished Professor of American History and the Director of the Bright Institute at Knox College, which is in Galesburg, Illinois. That's the northern flat part. Yes, yes very much so. Um, and her historical research has examined early 19th century experiences of pregnancy, childbirth, and child rearing in upper Midwestern Ojibwe and missionary cultures. So very interesting interdisciplinary um, indigeneity work. And research from her previous book, Making Marriage, Husbands, Wives, and the American State in Dakota and Ojibwe County, which was in 2013. So Kate is in the process of having a book that will come out in 2024, all about the pedagogy of kindness. Um, this is something that she's been writing about and speaking about. I know I follow her on Twitter, um, if Twitter is going to remain a thing and been able to hear her speak before. And um, this is one of those things that's very important at, at AU and really everywhere. We know that we are a residential campus. We want to be able to build relationships with our students and being able to have um, those important interpersonal relationships based on mutual trust is incredibly important. So we look forward to welcoming Kate. Uh, so if you want to come on up um, and uh, she, we're going to hear from Kate and then we'll have some questions at the end. So thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. It's so nice to see so many of you here today. So you can access uh, these slides at this case sensitive URL. So I'll give everybody just a moment if people wanna pull that up on their phone. Okay. And for those people who have vision or reading difficulties, there will be times when I'm reading all of the text that's on a slide, and I just want to flag why we're doing that. I always start my presentations by thanking the people who have taught me something. So I want to thank everybody who is at the Digital Pedagogy Lab in 2017, Charles Bailing and Roger Fisher, who are from the Program on Intergroup Relations at the University of Michigan, Karen Costa, Claire Mahoney, Judith Duttel, Melissa Whaler, and Jessamine Newhouse, who have all influenced me, especially in thinking about online teaching. Gabriel Rayleigh Carlin, Jennifer Fubert, Deirdre Doherty, Hilary Lehman, and Mary Arman are my colleagues at Knox College. And then of course, my students from whom I learn all the time. We are gonna do little bits of free writing during this presentation. So either you can grab a pencil and a piece of paper. There are actually swag notebooks at the back of the <laughs> uh, that Brad is gonna get, um, or pull up an app on your phone if you wanna just take some notes in your phone too, but um, grab whatever is useful. So I wanna start with this quote, for us to be transformed as individuals, we have to allow for the incompleteness of any of our truths. So this is a two-way conversation. I'm going to present my ideas, but I also want to hear back from you. I'm looking forward to your questions, and I am open to hearing things that will change my mind about stuff. Um, so I hope you are coming in thinking about this too. 
This is our agenda. I'm going to introduce myself a little differently. Um, academia and kindness is the next thing we'll talk about. We'll talk about learning and unlearning in higher ed. I'll talk about what a pedagogy of kindness is and is not. And then we'll finish by kindness towards the self because that's a key part of being able to be kind to other people. So I'm Kate Denial. I am originally from Sheffield in the north of England. I have lived in the United States for 29 years. And when I went to university, one hour south of where I grew up in Sheffield, no one understood me because of my dialect. And so I learned to replicate what I hear. Um, that was a problem last week when I was in Mississippi. Uh, but um, get me in a room full of Irish people or people from Texas and I will immediately start to mimic what I'm hearing. I am a first generation college student and this is the University of Nottingham where I got my BA. I emigrated to the United States in 1994 to go to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And then I got my PhD from the University of Iowa in 2005. Since then, I have been working at Knox College in Illinois. Please admire the most beautiful photo of a college campus ever taken. Um, we use it on everything. <laughs> the last thing that I watched was Unsellable Houses. Trashy HGTV is my wind down activity. I just started to read The Vasta Wilds on the flight here. I am a giant Captain America fan in all of his iterations. And if anybody is also a Captain America fan, I just want to nod to Bucky and I should have put him on here. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I had I love Captain America so much. I had the students in my public history class make an entire exhibit about the cultural impact of Captain America in historical perspective. I love to paint watercolors. I play the banjo very, very badly. And I also knit. So I'm very pleased to be here. I'm pleased to meet you. So let's talk about academia and kindness. Most people aren't setting out to be unkind in their teaching practices. So I want to establish that first. The problem is the culture in higher ed that we are all swimming in all the time, which is not a very kind culture. So a pedagogy of kindness aims to, oh, the coffee's here now, <laughs> um, aims to keep us oriented towards compassion despite all the pressures that surround us. It provides structure to make our kindness visible and practical. So there are three parts to it. Justice, believing students, and believing in students. So I wanna start by defining terms. Martina Spada said in Policing the Planet, no change for the good ever happens without it being imagined first, even if that change seems hopeless or impossible in the present. Author Jason Reynolds said, but how does one keep an imagination fresh in a world that works double time to suck it away? And I think that the answer is one must live a curious life. So what does kindness mean to you? This is our first little free write. So take a couple of minutes and just jot down some ideas. No one else is gonna see this. This is just for you and I will keep time.
Okay, finish the thought that you are writing or thinking. And thank you for taking that moment to pause and think about orienting yourself towards what your personal value of kindness is. What does kindness mean to me? Well, I always start with what it is not. Kindness is not being nice. I must pause and say that the reason there's a dog on the slide is because there are few free photos that come up when you search for kindness on pexels.com. And one was this dog and I thought, who am I to argue? So <laughs> nice puts band-aids over deep wounds in our institution and our profession. It lies about precarity, for example, and how much, how many people working in higher ed are in precarious positions. It lies about the power imbalances that are through, power, uh, through higher ed. It lies about things like tradition and rigor and what those words mean and what they can also be used as ciphers for. It lies about our burnout and our exhaustion, especially as we continue to go through this pandemic. It lies about ableism and who is thought of as deserving of an education. In opposition, kindness is honest. It's honest about our positionality. And these are some little excerpts from my book. Academia continues to be hostile to so many of us on the basis of race, gender, sexuality, religion, nationality, citizenship, disability, and class. Where do we have power and where do we suffer from its lack? It's honest about accountability. To dismiss the places where we trip in word, thought, or action without reflecting on the import of each is nothing more than being nice, relieving ourselves of responsibility and prioritizing feeling good over being just. And it's honest about being a discipline. So I wanna make clear I have not reached any mountaintop. I am not any kind of Buddha figure. We are not always going to feel like being compassionate. We do not need to direct our energy into niceness. Instead, we need to remind ourselves that we believe in compassion and act upon that belief, even on the days when we're spitting mad, hollowed out and heart sore. So I'm gonna move into thinking about what we have learned in the culture of higher ed and what we need to unlearn within that same culture. So is academia kind? This is the participatory part. No. no. <laughs> that is the correct answer. Generally, no, it is not. And we are socialized into distrust in academia along multiple different axes. The idea of the solitary genius, right? The superstar academic, the person alone in their office in an ivory tower, the way that superstar academics are sort of held up as the ideal of what it is to participate in higher education is really damaging. It doesn't allow us to think about collaboration. It doesn't allow us to think about the ways we might cooperate with one another. And it doesn't reward those things either. There is competition, competition for grants, competition for office space, competition for the best classroom. Competition is everywhere in higher education. Ableism is a really important part of what makes higher ed culture sometimes very toxic. So the higher ed is built upon the idea that only certain people should have a higher education. And we have a long way to go before we get to the point where everybody, regardless of ability, is able to participate. It's often been about exclusion too. The history of higher ed is one in which there has been a slow expansion of who can get that education over time, right? Along axes of ethnicity and race and gender, many more axes too. And there within that culture is a culture of antagonism towards students. And this is the most, I've lost the word, but uh, it's sinister, right? And it is not something that we, you know, sort of sign up for. It's not something that we go into academia thinking like, I'm going to be hostile to students, right? It is something that is in the water, right? And it, it, it is everywhere. So take me as an example. 
when I became a graduate student, I immediately started teaching undergraduates. I had graduated one month before I started teaching. So this was a terrible situation. But the, te the training that I got taught me certain things. Students are our antagonists. Students plagiarize. Students cheat. Students won't do the reading. Students challenge their grades. And this was compounded when after graduate school, I became a professor. Um, life as a new professor was so profoundly overwhelming for me. If you think back to when you started, I'm sure you felt many of the same things. I also had post-traumatic stress disorder that I had hidden. And I masked it because I thought I would get fired if they found out that I had PTSD. So I was struggling on many, many fronts while trying to establish myself as a new professor. I had no models for explicit kindness in front of me. That meant that I was especially overwhelmed. And then there was the student who said, you're just not Knox material. Um, he was having a really hard time in my class, was not enjoying himself. I asked him to come to office hours so that we could talk about a way to make it perhaps more pleasant for both of us. And when I asked him what would help, that's when he looked at me and very witheringly said, you're just not Knox material. Now, he had certain ideas in his head about what a professor looked like and how they should comport themselves, right? Um, but there was some kernel of truth in what he was saying that I only got to many years later, which was that at that moment, I was a, not a good professor. So how did I learn to do things differently? There are four things. The first is a project called Bringing History Home, which was in Iowa from 2001 to 2011. I was the lead historian on that program, and we taught over 900 teachers, mostly elementary school teachers, how to do history, hands-on history, get into the primary sources and make the narratives themselves. They then taught that to their students as young as kindergarten. And that's an amazing thing when you see K through five students building history for themselves. The master teachers who are part of this program were some of my earliest examples of profound kindness and patience. I, in 2013, went with a group of other people from my college to the Intergroup Dialogue Institute at the University of Michigan. We were sent to figure out if we should have a program like it at Knox. We recommended that we should, and then we're told to make it. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> so uh, Intergroup Dialogue is a very structured way of having conversations about contentious social issues, things like race, class, gender, religion, sexuality, gender. And once you start with the vulnerability that is intrinsic to the intergroup dialogue process, it's it won't stay in its bucket, it slops everywhere. And so it had a ramifications for the way that I taught all my classes, not just for this program. Living with PTSD has been a great instructor. Um, I had to learn to be kind to myself as a prerequisite for understanding that everybody really deserved kindness. And the last thing was that I went to the Digital Pedagogy Lab in 2017 in Fredericksburg, Virginia. There we were asked to critically evaluate absolutely everything about our teaching. And in 2017, I thought I was a pretty good teacher. I wanted to have good relationships with my students. I wanted to be their advocate. I wanted to cheer them on. I wanted to see them do great work. But when I was asked to look at all of my documents, my assignments and my syllabus and everything else, what I discovered was that I was not communicating any of those things to my students. DPL was the first time I had been asked so bluntly to defend my pedagogical, uh, pedagogical choices. And once I reflected, I found much of my pedagogy indefensible. At the time I felt regret and no small amount of embarrassment. My teaching was undone by a question that was never articulated quite this directly, but was everywhere around me. Why not be kind? I would like you to take just a couple moments, again, just for yourself, and think about a time that someone in academia 
did something kind for you that made a real impact upon you. So take just a couple of minutes and I will keep time for you again. Okay, finish up the thought that you're having, that you're writing. The great thing about this question is that everybody has one of those moments, sometimes multiple ones of those moments that demonstrate just how powerful kindness has been in our experiences. So thank you for taking the time to pause and think about that. So let's get to the meat and potatoes of what a pedagogy of kindness is. It helps to keep us oriented towards compassion despite the pressures around us. And it is made up of justice, believing students, and believing in students. So let's take the justice part of this first. 71% of undergraduates nationally are non-traditional students by this definition offered by Chris McDonald. They were at least 25 years old, attend school part-time and work full-time, are a veteran, have children, wait at least one year after high school before entering college, have a GED instead of a high school diploma, are a first generation student, are enrolled in non-degree programs or have re-entered a college program. This is a much more expansive definition of non-traditional than many people use, but I think it's useful for us to think about what is happening within our student body and all of the different things that they may be experiencing. That is the wrong slice. 10% of undergraduates at American, not at UTC, identify as first-generation college students. 18% of undergraduates at American received Pell Grants in 2022. 37% of undergraduates in America identify as Black, Indigenous, or a person of color. 20% of undergraduates nationally identify as LGBTQIA+. Now, that is probably a low figure because there are real risks in some places to coming out. And so this is going to be underreported. Similarly, the figures say that 19% of undergraduates nationally have a disability, Again, this is going to be underreported because this is based on people who are seeking accommodations. And there are all kinds of hurdles in the way of many people doing that. Money, time, access, health insurance, all kinds of things. 43% of four-year undergraduates nationally have experienced housing insecurity during their time toward degree. And 29% of that same cohort have experienced food insecurity while seeking their degree. So what does this have to do with kindness? It's about questioning our assumptions. It's about learning who our students are and who they are not. It's about extending the benefit of the doubt to our students and making realistic assessments of the costs involved. And it's about getting rid of hoops that we make them jump through. It's about believing in what and how much students are telling us about their own educational experience. So that's justice. 
So what about believing students and believing in students? So these are some things you may have heard in your time as a faculty or staff member when students are unable to turn in an assignment. So they may say, my printer broke, I was sick, someone died, my laptop crashed. There are many other things they may say too. And I would say that in every one of these instances, the thing to do is to believe them. Now, I always get questions about cultivating trust this way, but my point is twofold. Am I gonna disbelieve a student who is in genuine crisis? Can I deal with outlying situations as and when they come up rather than being suspicious of absolutely everybody's motivations? Because even if a student is lying about why they couldn't get that assignment in, there is some underlying problem that prevented them from doing it. And that needs attention. Believing in students is another part of this. So we're believing in rethinking our syllabi assignments, activities, and homework with trust in mind and collaborating with students on their learning. So I wanna make this concrete and use myself as an example. Again, in 2017, I thought it was a great teacher, right? So at the Digital Pedagogy Lab, I was asked several questions. Who is the student you're imagining as you write your policy documents and your assignments? What do you communicate about who you are, who I am in the way that I talk about policies? And are my syllabus and assignment sheets accessible to as many students as possible? So who was the student I was imagining? I realized it was a student I did not trust. I thought that they were gonna screw up somehow and I was waiting for that moment. What did I communicate about me? I communicated that I was in a position of unassailable authority and I wasn't approachable. And my documents were not accessible. They were giant walls of text. So this is the beginning of a syllabus from 2017 before I went to DPL. You can see I just launch into things, right? There's no hello or welcome or it's great to have you in class. It's just Kate denial. Um, <laughs> my office, my phone number, this is all important stuff, but it's offered in this very dry remote way, right? And there's no explanation of my email policy, just this 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., except 5 p.m. Friday to 5 p.m. Saturday. What does that mean exactly? This class will follow American history. This is one of the driest introductions to a survey class that has ever been put into print. <laughs> and these, and then I just go straight to required text. This is what one of my syllabuses look like now. So I have a cheerful header that has alt text embedded so that if someone's using a screen reader, they know what that image is. I also do that so that the syllabus looks welcoming. It's not just that giant wall of text. I say welcome and I model pronoun use. I do not demand that my students tell me their pronouns whether, in case they don't want to, but I model that I believe that pronouns are important. I use a really clear font that's easy to read and I'm very transparent here about what I meant when I said 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on the previous syllabus, right? Saturdays and Sundays are my recharge days. So I will occasionally check my email, but Karen can, cannot guarantee you a quick reply. I have icons down the left side of my screen to help students navigate all the textual information that I'm giving them. I am not suggesting that you make a syllabus that looks exactly like mine, but simply that you give thought to some of the ways that I have reimagined my syllabus. I have a UDL framing for my work. UDL is Universal Design for Learning, which is uh, operates on the principle that we should be designing our courses for as many different kinds of learning as possible. I don't use a lot of red or green in case someone has red green colorblind deficiency. I maximize the ways that people can communicate. So here, this is about um, our Office of Disability Services. I provide the phone number, I link directly to the email, right? If there were a website, I would also have put that website there. If there were a chat, I would have also made sure that there was a URL to that. Here is an even more concrete example. This is the honor code 
or my statement about the honor code from my original syllabus. The Knox College community expects its members to demonstrate a high degree of ethical integrity in all their actions, including their academic work. Examples of academic dishonesty include plagiarism, giving or receiving unauthorized help, voluntarily assisting another student cheating, and dishonestly obtaining an extension. This is so British. It's so profoundly about me being a very stern British nanny figure here. This is what my honor code statement says now. We, not just them, we commit ourselves to act with academic integrity this term, to be ethical in what we say and write, and to offer credit to others for thinking of ideas before us. And this is the most important line. I believe that everyone in my course is fundamentally honest. That's such a change from the language before, which was really sort of saying, you're probably gonna screw up at some point and terrible things will happen when you do. I also rethought my assignments. So I'm a historian. Traditionally, the culminating project in my upper level research classes was a research paper. I was very wedded to the idea that my students had to write something in order to show me that they had learned something. But I wanna pause for a moment. My undergraduate and graduate professors taught me that historians communicate through writing, that the act of writing is inseparable from the act of knowing. This is plainly untrue. It has taken academia years and it's an ongoing process to reveal people's assumptions about who gets to participate in academic spaces based on the expectation that knowledge should be written down. If we insist that students must demonstrate their understanding of concepts, principles, and ideas through writing alone, we risk marginalizing and alienating students whose disabilities make it difficult to express themselves through that medium and organize words on a page. It is vital that we distinguish between the substance we hope our students know and the means by which they tell us they know it. So I am not advocating here for like pitch writing. Writing's no good, right? I'm suggesting that if we truly wanna know what our students know, we need to give them more opportunities to show that to us than simply writing stuff down. So this is my original research paper. I have a very formal yet vague, oh, it's so vague. Um, formulate your own question about this course. Uh, identify the resources that will help you answer your question, research the topic and write up your findings in an eight to 10 page paper. There are some, uh, there I sort of stipulate how many sources of what type they have to use. This is very much based on my distrust that they would do it correctly if I did not tell them. This is some scaffolding that I included on the assignment sheet. Scaffolding is great. Scaffolding is necessary. But what I didn't really realize as I gave them all these points was that this was me trying to make up for not having taught them how to do these things in our class time. So I thought, well, these are things they should know and I'm irritated now that they maybe don't know them. So I'm just gonna put them in a list and make sure that everybody knows what to do. And then I had a checklist because this was the world's longest assignment sheet. Um, here it's key that I tell them how to cite, that they must cite in Chicago style, but I don't tell them where to find it. I don't link to anything. I just assume that they're gonna know. And again, 12 point font, one inch margins, keep a copy of your paper. These are all about my distrust of my students. This is what my assignment sheets tend to look like now. So again, that same cheerful header, the same icons down the left-hand side to help them navigate the text. But this is now a co-created assignment. Your second assignment is to show me what you've learned this term in any medium but a paper. That means you could create art, photography, music, dance, poetry, rap, a map, a zine. The sky is the limit. Think about what skills you have that you can bring to this assignment. So I'm literally just asking, what do you know? And they get to choose the medium in which they show me that. There's scaffolding still. 
So I tell them what they have to do, a proposal when it's due, that they have to have a reflective paper that goes with this. Um, I link to the Chicago Manual of Style and I repeat the dates at the end because that's always the thing that people look for in a panic. I also started collaborating with my students on grading. Now, now I'm fully doing ungrading where I do not give out a grade uh, at all, but I started one little step at a time. So I wanted to encourage metacognitive reflection from my students. I wanted them to think about what they were learning. And I also wanted to focus on their strengths in my feedback. So I started by having them fill out a self-evaluation sheet. And they brought this in when they brought in their paper. So you can see that these are some very simple questions at the beginning. Did you turn your paper in on time? Did you ask to turn it in late? But the second page was where the really good stuff got going. <laughs> In what way was this paper an act of exploring new intellectual territory for you? What discoveries did you make about yourself? How could you improve before your next assignment? And is there anything else I should know in relation to you in this paper? Which is where I found out things like, my boyfriend broke up with me last night. Um, my beloved pet died at home, all kinds of different things. There's also different kinds of assignments that can do a lot of the work of getting our students to think creatively for us. So authentic assessment is part of this. Authentic assessments have meaning outside of our classrooms and usually are for an audience that's not just us. So Knox has a thing called Biofuels Week. Um, the general chemistry students create a biofuel. The organic chemistry students identify its components and the physical chemistry students perform combustion tests to determine its efficiency. Now, they then present this to a panel of alums and other chemistry professors uh, to sort of say what they've done. This is what some students had to say about this experience. This lab teaches me how to work as a team member and how to communicate effectively, which is important for my career as a research scientist. We have a chance to learn not only technical skills, but also interpersonal skills. <laughs> I think my experiences in all of my labs leading up to Biofuel Week helped me prepare for this. Because we were working with general organic and physical chemistry, there were concepts that I learned as a first year that came back up that week. So metacognitive reflection again. Before Nux.com is an authentic assessment I did with my students during the height of the pandemic. Normally I would have them build an exhibit, but instead we built a website that was about the history of the place that Nux is located before Nux was there. So they built a series of blog entries. They made a timeline that had primary sources attached to everything on it. They did their own research into a particular issue and we had the world's most beautiful bibliography. <laughs> but this was an authentic assessment in that it was important to people beyond me, beyond that class. So this was a message that we got from Anna Naruto Moya um, about how she had used this in a very real world setting. It doesn't have to be a big culminating assignment either. It can be something very small. So I have reading check-ins every time my students do some reading. And you can see, I asked them how much of the reading they did, which is not about being punitive. It's so I'm prepared if everybody only did 50% of the reading that day, right? What new things did you learn? What is important that we talk about? And what left you confused? I take all of these and then I use it to make my lesson plan for the day. So my students get a feedback loop from me without me having to respond to every single one of these things. I also ask my students at the end of each week to look back on the week and tell me the three most important things that they learned. And that way they're doing the metacognitive uh, reflection and they're doing recall, right? They're doing retrieval practice. So they're gonna remember these things much more vividly. So this is about believing in students' ability to have input into their course policies and grading and students' ability to co-create things like syllabi and assignments. It's also about students' investment in the courses that they get to shape. So 
So I'd like you to reflect for just a couple of minutes on one small thing you could do to increase, increase collaboration with your students in your courses. I will keep time for you. Okay, finish up your thoughts. The last thing I wanna talk about is kindness towards the self. So kindness towards the self includes some really basic things, not trying to change everything at once. There are times when I wanna burn it down, <laughs> but that is actually a phenomenally large undertaking, right? To then rebuild from the ground up. Recognize that you are the authority in your classroom and about your classroom experience. We are embodied people who have very different experiences of walking into a classroom and being respected or not respected as professors or faculty and staff, right? So recognize that you are the authority and that you may need to tweak things to be true to your experience. Know the boundaries you need that are gonna work for you and give yourself time and space. So I tell people plus one, just do one thing differently. And then next semester, do another plus one. It took me five years to go from grading very traditionally to where I am now. And those five years were super important. Kindness towards the self involves some other things. Here are some suggestions. Set some email hours and make sure they are very clearly communicated to all of your students. So don't be available 24 seven, right? Clearly demark when you are going to reply to things and when you're not. It also sets up expectations for your students so they know if they email you at 2 a.m., you're not gonna be able to help them. Take a day away from email every week. Be even more radical and take your email off your phone. Um, email is always going to be there. It's never going to go away, right? And having a boundary where you're like, I need some time away from this to recharge is so, so important and makes such a difference to who we are. Time for lunch or time for dinner, depending on your schedule, maybe even time for both. Um, this, I got diagnosed as a type two diabetic two years ago. And that was when I realized I couldn't eat mini Snickers bars for lunch anymore. And it should not have taken a major medical diagnosis for me to realize that was a terrible way to take care of myself. So I started having to make sure that I was eating properly at lunchtime and having a lunchtime instead of doing meetings. And this should not have been the case. I should have been able to just do that anyway for a very, very long time. So whatever the break is that you need, whenever you need it in your day, demark that time as yours. 
Commuting is work. I just came from Bethesda this morning and that was work and I was sitting in the back of a lift. So, <laughs> um, so more than anywhere else I've been, you commute, you have a lot of work. So count it towards the amount of energy you have in a day. You have a finite amount of personal resources and some of them are spent before you even get to campus. So don't think to yourself, I'm gonna do eight hours in the office when you have an hour's commute at the beginning and the end of your day, right? That means you're working 10 hours. So think of it that way. Build in flex days in your syllabus right from the beginning of term. So flex days are multi-purpose, right? They float. And it might be that uh, your students got really confused about a concept or an equation. It might be that discussion went amazingly well and it's spilling over. It might be that people need a mental health day. It might be that you have to react to something that has happened nationally or internationally, right? Build a couple of days in that float so that those things don't disrupt your calendar and you're not left scrambling to catch up again, okay? And create community. Now your community could be in many different places on campus. It might be your department, it might be your division, it might not. Um, my department, we get along really well, but we don't hang out together. All of my friends are in other places on campus. Make sure that you are cultivating some community for yourself, whether it is on campus or off, because community is what sustains us when things are particularly difficult. So what is one place that you could show yourself kindness this semester yet, okay? So take a minute to write down a couple ideas for kindness you could show yourself. Okay, finish up your thoughts. So let's try and bring this all full circle. In conclusion, I want to share part of a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Thank you very much. We have time for a Q and A. These big white things on the ceiling are microphones our microphones so they will catch and pick up your voices so if you have a question please feel free to like raise your hand and ask yes so you said you don't have to don't give grades at all does marks allow you not to even do a final grade so we have to turn in a final grade at the end of the term we're on trimesters but i uh scaffold it so that my students write an essay at the end of the term that's metacognitive. They reflect on their learning. 
and they tell me what grade they think they have earned. And I reserve the right to raise grades because there's great research about who is likely to underestimate how well they have done. Um, but I don't lower grades. And in all the time I've been doing this, I've only had one student who gave themselves a grade that I profoundly disagreed with. Um, but I think that's a really good ratio, actually, about all the students that I've taught. So that's so then I turn in the grade that the student has identified. And there's a workshop about ungrading tomorrow, so you can come learn more. Other questions? Yeah. So I'm a librarian, and so we're kind of the special guests that get to come into the class. And I was wondering if you had had any experiences working with the librarians on your campus and talking to them about how we might also include these concepts in our own instruction when we're coming to visit other people. Yeah. I can't speak to like, there's so many disciplines, right? So many ways that you might be asked to come into a classroom, but I can tell you what I do with the librarian who's the liaison for history. We used to do a thing where the librarian sort of stood here and talked at everybody for the whole class period and walked them through how to do things. What we together changed it to was a series of things that students had to do and then they had to show us they'd done it and learn how to cite the thing they had done, right? So the first thing was they had to learn how to find a book because they didn't know how to use the stacks because um, they're so used to using digital materials. So they had to go find a book, then they had to look on either side of the book that they found, right? So that they could see if there were other things around, pick that book, bring it downstairs, show us the physical book and then learn how to cite that book. And then we went through articles and we went through websites. And so they had to do multiple different things. And the librarian and I floated to check their citation and to help them out, to walk them to the bookcases if that was what they needed. And it's so much more interactive. The students are doing so much better at library research because of it. Um, but that was something we came up with together to try and make it more participatory. Thank you so much, and sorry about my voice. I'll do my best. I have a mic now. So that was very interesting. Thank you. I was just wondering, very like, you know, me thinking whether you talk about academia in a very universal fashion, mm -hmm. as if, you know, the kind of things you stated at the beginning would apply to any context, cultural context or regional context or whatever. And I'm not saying that, you know, other places are better or worse, and we could just probably find, you know, many, many problems anywhere. But I was wondering whether you acknowledge that this is quite contextualized. Maybe I I did my PhD in Liverpool, so we have something in common there. So I, you know, I do understand what you when you talk about the British kind of rigor and all of this, but have you thought about this? Is it part of the introduction or something? Yeah, it's very much, I mean, all of it's contextual, but what I'm trying to get at with talking about the sea in which we're swimming are the more unfortunate things about academia that are pervasive, right? So you might be having a one, you might teach at an incredible university. I hope this is that place for you, right? And you might, um, you might have a great department, you might feel very satisfied and not pressured by some of these things, but they're still out there. You pick up the Chronicle, you pick up higher ed, inside higher ed, you see these things all the time being discussed and the pushback against things like accommodations for students with disabilities. Like there have been columns in both the Chronicle and inside higher ed very recently doing both of those things, right? Um, there are things in the news right now about academic superstars and mismanagement potentially of funds and all kinds of things, right? There's a culture that says being an academic superstar is what we're all supposed to head toward, whether or not we buy that or not. So I'm talking about like the pervasive sense of the structures of higher ed, which can all be mitigated by individual contexts, by regions, by cultures, by all of those things, but they still exist even when people are mitigating them. 
sorry. So can I just, yeah. So you would think that this can exist like if you teach in Bolivia? I don't know about Bolivia. This is very US based. That's, that's yeah. what, thank yeah. you. That's exactly what I was thinking, that whether you acknowledge that this US, maybe Anglo. I was going to say Anglo because I've yes. worked with people in New yeah. Zealand, Australia, or in the UK, and it's it's worse. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I had this in mind. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Here, thank you so much. Apart, apologies for being late, but I'm glad I made it. I'm curious how you've talked with your students about the connection of this and what they're going to expect when they get in the workplace and graduate. I teach strategies and stress management and. In my work, I coach people in the workplace. I coach organizations that are dealing with burnout and stress. So have you had a conversation how have students responded about what this might look like when they're out of these walls, mm -hmm. out of this bubble of university life? Mm -hmm. I think for most of our students, it's not a bubble. Um, I think for most of our students, the real world is very intrusive. And, um, and that they're already negotiating a world that is not very kind. And they have been negotiating it for a long time, right? I mean, I think of K-12 education and there's so many things about K-12 education that are just unkind and stressful. And, you know, so they come to us already primed. Um, it is unusual for them to then encounter kindness. And I don't think what that does is make them forget the rest of the stuff, right? It gives them a different set of tools and a different set of expectations and it allows them to move the needle themselves in what they wanna do. So I think that I have not seen any evidence from my students who have graduated and gone on to do many different things that they were unprepared for the world outside of college um, because they, they have been in that world the whole time. I think that's what I would say. We have a question from the online attendees. Sure. If an instructor isn't using ungrading, what strategies could a teacher use to ensure that assessment is equitable if students are doing a wide range of projects? So that particular NSA thing that I shared is very structured. Students, uh, when I first started teaching it, they turned in a proposal that I then got to vet and they still do that, right? But they also then took um, grading standards that we collectively had decided on at the beginning of term and they adapted that grading standard list to reflect the kind of project that they were doing. And they turned that in with their proposal and they got feedback on that as well as the proposal itself. So then when it came to grade all those on essays, I had an individualized grading sheet for absolutely every student, right? And I had already seen it. I had already said yes, or I had said, we need to change this or add this or do something to it, right, to make it work. Um, so that was how I handled that issue of trying to make sure that the grades meant something across, you know, whether someone was doing a wrap or making a quilt, right? Um, so how do you think, or do, if you just want to comment, the increased precarity of faculty in, interacts with um, pedagogies of kindness, with like adjunctification of the academy and the attacks on tenure that are happening. Yeah. Do you think those contribute to that um, tension? Yes, very much so. And, you know, state legislature is getting involved in people's classroom activities and saying what you can and cannot teach and all of those kinds of things. Um, places being stripped for parts like West Virginia University right now, right? Um, on precarity uh, and contingent faculty, the thing that I see as being the greatest challenge is time because so many people are trying to stitch together an income from multiple different campuses, right? And if you are a road warrior who is driving all over the place to be able to put together an income, you don't have the kind of time to be able to invest fully and deeply in what you maybe want to do, right? It That really limits you. Um, so in the book in particular, I try to tease out like, if you're contingent, here are some ways you can adapt this. Here are some ways you can take it this far and not take it as far as I'm ultimately saying we might want to go, right? And this is when it comes back to you. You are the expert on your classroom experience and what it is possible to do within that particular context. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And 
Um, I'm with you 100%, I want to say. So I want to ask you to respond to the people who push back, the faculty who say, I'm, the academy is rewarding me for my research, and everything you're suggesting here is a student-centered classroom that's very individualized and takes a lot of our time. And so our faculty have incentives for uh, limiting time in their teaching. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to a faculty member um, who, who is, yeah, who's, who's uh, you know, dealing with that tension? And have you started to think also about pushing how to push the administration to have a more student-centered, teaching-focused uh, academy? Uh, so let me answer those backwards. Um, the book is very much targeted at faculty and staff who are teaching because the classroom is a space that we control, right, to some degree. And um, because we have that kind of autonomy, that's where I wanted to start is to say, no matter what your situation is, there are tiny things that you can start doing that are gonna make a real impact on your students. I am the PI on a Mellon funded grant called Care in the Academy that is trying to expand this into the ways that the structures of higher ed are working. So we have 10 campuses, including our ones, regional publics, liberal arts colleges and community colleges. And then we have 10 mostly contingent people who are thinking about what if you don't have much of a connection to the campuses where you teach, right? And these 36 individuals have done a ton of research into what it would look like to be trauma aware, what it would look like to really think about what disability means in academia and what it means to make pedagogy sustainable for us, right? Not just sustainable for students. Um, so that's like another project that I have going on that we're trying to do. The first question, remind me again, just, Real quick, the faculty, who the faculty who are researching. Yeah, um, this is where the plus one thing works, right? That you don't have to change absolutely everything and make it into an enormous job of work. You can change one small thing and see what the consequences are, right? See if it's making a measurable impact in your class. The little things that I talked about, like the reading responses, right? That I do not grade. Um, if I had teaching assistants, they would not have to grade either. But that informs some of the questions that I walk into the classroom with, right? There are other ways of showing a feedback loop than just responding to lots and lots of work, right? Um, so that's part of the way that I'm suggesting people can shift, right? Make the one little change and then make another one and another one. And ultimately everything can be different, but you didn't have to burn it down. Resist. Uh, thank you. This was definitely the most important hour and a half I'll be spending this week. Um, yeah. uh, several, many of us here are thinking about putting together a teaching portfolio <laughs> uh, for our work. And um, some of the things that we're asked to do for that are um, giving uh, some, some demonstrating ways that we do self-evaluations, ways that we invite peers to do evaluations of our work, and uh, ways that we uh, can harvest feedback from students as well. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, you were just talking about kind of like, you know, the plus one, making a change, evaluating how it's working. Do you have any suggestions for creative ways to that we could demonstrate those types of evaluations in our portfolios? The way that I do evaluations is that, um, so I have that metacognitive essay at the end of the term, right? Where my students get to say, what was most meaningful? On what did they learn that they're not going to forget? What did what seems most important to them? So they're open-ended questions. And from that, I get lots and lots of information about what is and isn't working. Um, and so sometimes it'll be things I did not anticipate at all. Or they'll be like, everything about X was a tragedy. And I'm like, okay, well, we won't do that next time. All right. Um, but those essays are so fruitful, not only for me and having a different kind of feedback, especially from like whatever the evaluations are where you're coloring little buttons in, right? But they 
are really dependent upon the personality of a class, right? They get to the heart of that. And you're doing your students a service by saying, would you please reflect on your learning processes so that that becomes more concrete for them? Um, so that's the way that I have done that. Um, the other thing I would say about teaching portfolios is if you are being asked to write a teaching philosophy, write your first draft addressed to your students, not to other faculty, not to staff, not to administrators. Write to your students and explain why you teach the way that you do. And then you can go back and you change the language and you can say like, you know, like, well, and this is the thing, right? So that it's not that directed at that, right? But that changes everything about writing those philosophies because suddenly you have a concrete set of people who may not know what your pedagogical choices are. And it makes it so much easier to articulate that stuff. Thank you so much for for visiting our campus. We're so uh, pleased that you're here. Um, I'm Barbara. I teach in this school on alternatives to war and violence. And um, I had an amazing experience with my colleagues, uh, Becca Comfort and um, Adam, where we were looking at equity across grading, across the whole campus. And all these light bulbs went off for me because we had to examine the syllabi of all of our colleagues across disciplines. And I realized for the first time after 23 years of teaching, that students have to sort of psychoanalyze their professors. Mm -hmm. And if they have six different professors each semester, they have to figure out like, what are our expectations? What are our demands? And, and I just realized, oh my gosh, uh, these poor young people are, are having to uh, figure us out uh, and what it is that is, you know, driving the class demands of them. And I, I just think that that was so helpful to me in uh, becoming more transparent. Um, and I'm gonna borrow all your techniques to even become more open, um, asking them, you know, is this clear? You know, I know you're trying to figure out your business professor, your communications professor, all these different classes they're taking. But also the grading and equity committee, um, we discovered that we did have a lot of biases in how we graded and um, and that uh, it may, heightened my awareness um, so much um, of the lens through which we look at students. Um, but please comment on that if you would. Um, I could go on a whole riff about grading, but there's an ungrading thing tomorrow, right? Tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow morning. I. I'm forgetting in what order we're doing things, um, where I can get into the research about what grades do and do not represent. Mm -hmm. But if you are someone who is grading, then I think one of the most valuable things you can do is have a rubric or a, a, a descriptive list of this is what an A is, this is what a B is, this is what a C is, right? I actually started mine when I did this with a C and was like, this is... Uh, what everybody can achieve, right? And then you exceed that to get a B and exceed it to get an A so that my students didn't have that high school thing of everybody gets 100 and it's all demerits from there, right? It's just ways you screwed up all the way down, right? I, instead, I was like, no, this is how you succeeded. This is how you got a higher grade, right? But we would have that list. We would annotate it. Everybody would annotate it. And then we would talk about it. And we would edit it. Um, if they had objections to certain categories or certain things, then we would talk about, okay, what do other people think? And not until we had consensus, did it become the document that we used. Now, depending on the size of your class, there's different ways that you can do this kind of thing, right? Like if you are not with a small class, an upper level class, um, and you've got an enormous lecture hall, that's a different thing, right? And you need different tools for it. But I think that having the students buy in and tell you what seems fair and what doesn't seem fair and what's clear and unclear is a really great start to any particular semester. Kate, thanks so much. Um, we've bumped into the 11 o'clock hour, so I think I have to officially dismiss us. But um, <laughs> thank you once again. So maybe another round of applause for Kate. Uh, 
If you want to have more of these conversations, we've got three workshops coming up today at one o'clock. We're going to talk specifically about syllabi uh, at three, uh, sorry, two thirty. Thank you, two thirty. Uh, Care in the academy, and then tomorrow morning uh, on on uh, uh, grading. So um, if you haven't if you haven't signed up but want to do that, please just talk to me or Brad or whomever. We can get you uh, linked for that. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today, and those of you online, thank you so much. Um, uh, for those of you who are in person, we we do have uh, coffee and uh, uh, some breakfast treats back there. Uh, help yourselves, and uh, we've got some uh, uh, AU Core uh, swag here also for thanking you for coming. So thanks, uh, thanks so much, everybody. Hope to see you uh, today and tomorrow. Thank you.